Hey guys, it's Howie, and I just wanted to report on my first day at the ICU. My first day at the ICU was pretty good, but things could have been much, much better. Uh, for example, I could have prepared a lot better. When I try to think about going to the ICU, I try to read too many sources and I couldn't fill my brain with enough things because I didn't know exactly what I was going to get into. So I've been to the CV ICU, I've been to regular uh, PACU, PACU, I've been to uh, MICU, but only as a clinical rotation. So I've been in these ICUs only as a student which basically meant that I had a preceptor, but I didn't have any rights. Basically, I couldn't get medications by myself. I couldn't do any procedures by myself. I was basically just observing. This time around, at my externship, I was doing a lot more than that. I was given a lot more responsibilities. For example, there was a couple of students that was also from my school, and they were doing the rotation where I was. It was in the neuro ICU as well, however, they were doing it as their clinical residency. Now, I had finished that residency already, as you can tell from my previous videos, because I did med surge during my residency. I was disappointed at first because I thought med surge was kind of like below me, but I was pleasantly surprised. It was really, really hard work. So that reputation is set in concrete. I think it's actually true. People that work in med surge work really, really hard. Not only because the patients can move, but they can also complain, and the family members are very emotional. Uh, they had just recovered from the ICU, and now they're in the med surge, and they're supposedly stabilized, but not quite yet to where they're going to be discharged. And so there's a lot of high tension and high emotions. And plus, you're also taking care of six patients in the med surge. So things are a little bit different when you're in the ICU. So my particular ICU where I was doing an externship was in the neuro ICU. So we see a lot of intracranial hemorrhage, we see subarachnoid hemorrhage, bad perfusion, a lot of neurological stuff. So most of the time, everybody's on a ventilator, everybody's on a telly, everybody's on everything. Not, they're not always on CRRT, that's mostly perfusion stuff over a, a cardiovascular units. But this particular patient that I had today was very unique at least for me it was, coming from a med surge and a hospice background. Most of my med surge patients were a lot of chronically ill patients, older patients that have had a lot of uh, secondary comorbidities from either being uh, diabetic or obese or having long-term hypertension and all the effects that come from those diseases. Usually those diseases overlap and some of them can also be cystic fibrosis or systemic lupus. So all these clinical, uh, all these chronic illnesses just pile up over and over and over again. Whereas in the acute care area over at the ICU, I was just taking care of one patient. So we had, we usually have one or two patients apparently. And the one patient that we had was actually the most complex person in that unit. <clears throat> so it was very difficult because in the beginning, for about two hours, we didn't really do much. I just did my assessments, I did my documentation, uh, double check to see exactly how the patient's setup was. For example, how his A-line and how his extraventricular drain happens, which is uh, some of the drains that come out of the cerebrospinal fluid that comes out of the brain that the nurses uh, keep track of so they can talk to the doctors about it and to make sure that the patient's intracranial pressure stays within a good normal range, which is usually uh, below 20. But I'm still learning all this stuff. Anyway, so my patient, even though we were at the neuro ICU, started to get worse. But it wasn't a particularly neurological problem that he had. He actually had multiple acute problems and neurological problems that he was initially admitted for here at the Neuro ICU wasn't actually our biggest problem that day. He had more cardiovascular problems and perfusion problems and respiratory problems uh, than anything else. So 
It wasn't a very neuro day for me at the neuro ICU, but I did get a chance to figure out exactly what the pace was for the intensive care unit. And so basically the first couple of hours uh, on my 12 hour shift was just kind of doing assessments and getting to know the patient as well as the family. He had a very good support system. Um, and uh, yeah, so the family was, was there and they were asking questions and it seemed like the guy was very much loved. And I like that. I think that really helps the patient whether or not they're all that conscious or if there's, um, uh, their level of consciousness or their Glasgow coma scale is below like let's say an eight so or even like a five. So it made it very easy to be able to paint the, pers the patient as a person. However, once that was done, there were so many lines on all these patients in the ICU. I could see just by walking through all the rooms, um, just walking by, um, no patient had less than four lines of medications uh, running through them at any one time. And they also had a couple of drains. A lot of patients were on that, like I said, the, the external ventricular drain, as well as um, Foley catheters and arterial lines. So just filled with so many lines and trach tubes and G tubes, everything that you can think of these patients had had. So it was to me at least justified that there was one nurse for about one or two patients because they needed to be assessed every hour on the hour. And it wasn't just intakes and outputs, it was also a lot of neurological checks and sensing to see if there's any changes to those checks and assessments. And so if you don't, if you don't stay up to this or you take um, a lunch that's too long or you choose to take your lunch in the wrong time, you could be instantly, um, you could instantly fall behind. And what really helps you is not just your skill as a nurse, that just keeps you afloat. What really helps you is the whole team in the ICU who comes in asking you for if you need any help. Hey, do you need any help? Is there anything I can do for you? Have you had a break? Were you able to go to the bathroom yet? These fellow nurses that my preceptor was working with took it upon themselves to walk all the way across from one side of the unit to go say hi and check up on us to make sure that we were doing good and that we weren't falling behind. And if the lab had brought any medications from upstairs, then they brought it directly to us. They didn't just say, hey, you got some labs or you've got some medications over there somewhere. No, they took it right, they took it themselves and they brought it right to us in the room because for about eight hours, I never left that room, basically, um, unless to go pee, maybe get a break and to chart and to finally sit down. I think I only sat down on probably about two or three times, uh, which was similar to what med surge was. And med surge, the only time I could sit down was around two o'clock p.m. after having coming in at 6.30 a.m. So um, at least I was able to build my endurance there. Again, this is another good reason to have a good experience in the med surge uh, unit because I was able to see almost every single kind of uh, medical comorbidity and medical condition um, under the sun. And it wasn't specialized. And it was very difficult to take care of men's surge patients because they were so varied, but it also gave me a good knowledge of what to do if anything else happened. So it was easy for me to switch from a neuro to a cardiovascular ICU kind of a set mode because of the experiences that I had over in the med surge. But there were some things that I wish I could have done better. Okay, so I made a list on it to see what I could have done better before I had come in to the ICU. So, um, these are just notes that I've jotted down while I was working today. And um, yeah, so again, I tried to read up on too many things in the ICU and I, I kinda went too far deep and too broad. So I wasn't able to really rein in exactly what I needed. But I hope this helps uh, somebody else who starts to uh, uh, get their experience of the ICU, whether or not they're in a student facility or if it's their first time. Uh, so these are the things that I wish I had known uh, and have been familiar with prior to starting my first day at the ICU. Um, uh, 
Uh, number one, really know the specialized section of the IC that you work at. So there's multiple, especially in big hospitals in large cities, there's not just one ICU, but there's multiple ICUs that deal with other things. There's um, the medical, uh, the treatment ICU, um, the medical treatment ICU that deals with transplants and people going back and forth over that. Um, and there's also the PACU, which is a post, post anesthesia care unit. It's also kind of like an ICU, I think. And there's a CV ICU, which is a cardiovascular ICU. And there's a neuro ICU, um, among other things. So I wish I had known and become more familiar with, um, with A-lines. Uh, I know I saw a lot of A-lines at the CVC ICU and we learned trauma at the next to the last semester of school. But I kind of had, had forgotten about it. I'd been testing every day that I have off on answering multiple, multiple, multiple questions on Kaplan, on Saunders, and I'm gonna sign up for UWorld because I really wanna pass that NCLEX um, the first time. And I had kind of, I had benefited from being in med surge, and so I recognized a lot of the questions, and I was still training myself on how to answer the correct question uh, within a minute or so, just in case I have to answer all the way to 265 questions. Um, so I was really building up my endurance, but I was mostly focusing on med surge. Well, I had forgotten a little bit of my critical care. So I, understand, I understood the general um, method of A-lines, but I kind of forgot how to zero and level my A-lines and also which way the stopcock goes in order to make sure that I clamp it before we can do any other procedures or move the bed and we have to readjust it and re-leveling. I wish I had known all that stuff because when I was in the ICU as a clinical, re um, uh, doing my clinicals in school, we just, I just kind of mostly observed and I just saw it like once or twice. Uh, another thing is that I wish I had known all my other critical values, for example, the end tidal CO2, which I know now is between around 30 and 43 uh, millimeters per mercury is a normal value. Um, I knew that the ICP normal value is usually around 20, but those change uh, once or, you know, uh, it, it kind of varies a little bit, well, just based on my patient, but for the most part, I, I should have known exactly the general um, um, normal parameters for this kind of stuff, you know, and now I've forgotten about it. So that involves not just Cushing's triad, which is a, you know, bradycardia, um, um, shoot, uh, bradycardia and widening pulse pressure as well as, as well as irregular breathing because, um, the patients really did, uh, show that a lot. And I didn't see that before in med surge or any other less subacute units. Um, but I was definitely looking out for it but usually Cushing's triad is a late sign and I didn't see that with the other departments of nursing that I, I've walked through and um, had my clinicals at. In the ICU, however, I see that a lot. At least today I did. Um, so yes, yeah, so knowing the ETCO2, knowing the uh, pulse pressures, knowing the MAP, knowing the CPP, which for neuro is what we look at, uh, which is basically, um, I'm pretty sure CPP is MAP minus ICP, which is a mean arterial pressure minus an intracranial pressure. So we look at that as well. And um, uh, knowing what my mean arterial pressure that they were looking for usually normally is around, um, at least for me, around 60 to 80. But um, for this hospital, they chose to want to keep the patient between 70 and 80 um, mean arterial pressure. So, and again, end tidal CO2. Uh, so, oh, and another one too is the patient's ABGs. Oh man, uh, the ABGs are really big here. Even though we also have really good uh, respiratory therapists, it's also on you to be able to know exactly what's a good end tidal CO2, what's a good PCO2, what's a good um, O2, and um, just know just know your metabolic alkalosis, acidosis, respiratory alkalosis, and respiratory acidosis, and just kind of know that off the top of your head, <clears throat> things like that. And it was really easy and it was nice to be able to draw blood straight from the A-line rather than having to try to 
um, just puncture the patient and um, you know insert a lot of needles even though uh, they really need a lot of lines uh, the ICU was able to or at least my preceptor was able to use what lines and peripheral IVs as well as um, yeah peripheral IVs that she could have to hang all eight of our lines and so she had to use a thing called a turkey what was it a turkey something but it helped to add uh, more ports to just the one IV catheter so if we had only two peripheral IVs she would use a turkey I keep forgetting what that name was but a turkey something to be able to put it on, <laughs> on one catheter and then another turkey something to put it in another in a second catheter um, and we would be able to infuse all, you know, four and four, so we could infuse all eight lines at the same time. And she had argued, not, not argued, but she tried to convince the interns to try to get an order to try to put in a pick line because this patient just had uh, way too many lines running through PIVs. And what made it more difficult was that she had to check to make sure that these lines were compatible. For example, a lot of the patients have antibiotics and then they also have potassium phosphate running and then normal saline and we also had um, pressors we had fentanyl we had um, uh, uh, Kepra for seizures lots and lots of things uh, running all at once so it was really hard to be able to make sure and see whether or not these medications were okay to be put in the same line and we had to keep checking over and over and have somebody verify with us to make sure that it was okay to put this all on the patient because the patient is unconscious and he can't tell us if it hurts or not so we have to be able to know this before we give any medications so that we don't make the patient any worse um, so yeah I wish I had known how to how to use uh, micromedics which is the online medical database that they use to be able to know which IV lines aren't compatible with what IV lines, you know? Because um, you yeah, had a lot of multiple antibiotics running. Many patients in the ICU have vancomycin or zosin running all at once. <clears throat> I also wish I knew how to recognize uh, waveforms. Since the patient was constantly monitored, uh, antihelic CO2s, respira respirations, pulse ox, um, not only were the numbers important for me to have known and have been familiar with from the get-go, I wish that I had known how to read the waveforms and not just the EKGs to make sure that the reading that I was getting was actually legit. <clears throat> so, yeah, I wish I had known that. I wish I also was familiar with tracheotomies um, and uh, trach tubes. I've seen trach tubes before, but usually in a home health facility where it was given to people who are still conscious and just ha needed you know, a, a tracheostomy to be able to function and do their, their active da daily living, activities of daily living. But these patients, again, in the ICU have a lot of trach tubes because they're not able to um, breathe on their own. So they're on ventilators that the respiratory therapist takes care of. So a lot of things like that. And I wish I had known the, um, I wasn't sure what an anti 10 a was as far as coagulation. So I'm going to be looking that up tonight. Um, I knew my PTT values, uh, because my patient was on a heparin drip, which I was also familiar with from med surge. Uh, the patient was, um, highly, he, he didn't come in as a diabetic, but, uh, the patient had high hyperglycemia and I've seen from the other nurses their patients have hyperglycemia as well it turns out you know because they're sick and we're pumping them with a lot of medication some of them some of the patients had steroids um, and they're also very injured and acutely injured and so you know the one just even though we're a neuro ICU it doesn't mean that we only take care of our neurological uh, conditions and I find that that's true with every single nursing department if you think that you're gonna go into a one nursing department and you're just gonna be taking care of like one condition you're wrong uh, patients can turn for the worse and their conditions are just like the patients they're living beings so the conditions can 
get worse or get better? Um, so I also, oh, turkey fist, I think it was. Turkey fist. Or turkey foot, sorry, turkey foot was what, <laughs> what we used to extend the catheters into more than, than one or two ports so we can extend it to four ports so we can just infuse a whole bunch of lines in there. Um, I also wish I had known how to immediately set up um, uh, IV infusions because uh, my preceptor, this was my, this was my first day, so she wasn't quite sure what I was capable of and she knew, knew I had med surge experience, but mostly when I was doing med surge, I hung a lot of IV piggybacks, but they were mostly just Zosin and maybe a little bit of vancomycin. But there was more than one medications that we hung over at the ICU and they involved, a, well, a, I mean, the basic premise was the same. You put in the medications in the small uh, normal saline bag or whatever solution have you and you squeeze the medication in there, you flip it around, make sure that you get all the um, solutions and you lock it up, stuff like that. But they would vary in different ways. And so um, I wasn't quite familiar with every single thing. And I knew how to hang uh, regular spikes and to put it into the bag. But when I was mixing the medication with it, some of them had to be protected from light. Some of them had to be squeezed. Some of them had to be shaken. And so, it wasn't that big of a deal, but when the patient was crashing, then it became more of a big deal because they were waiting on me to make sure that everything was primed before they can hang the bags because this patient was crashing. So I wish I had been faster with that. Um, I also wish I was more familiar with aneurysms. I mean, I know the basic gist of it as far as um, uh, aortic aneurysms and um, more, more of the common aneurysms, but not so much with the brain aneurysms. Um, I wasn't quite sure with the familiarity of the surgical procedures, how they go about finding where the bleeding is. Um, and there was also a complication with ICU patients as well, because you can't just send an ICU patient down imaging when they're going to be there for a couple of hours, because if they're not stable and they crash, then it's on you. There's nothing you can do. So basically a lot of the time, we thought that we were going to be able to bring the patient down to imaging, but we never got a chance to because the patient never stabilized. Um, our patient stayed alive, but uh, he wasn't as stable as we would have liked him to be. And um, so, yeah, uh, surgical treatments as far as like coiling, I wasn't familiar with that, uh, with aneurysm. So I'm going to have to uh, brush up on that as well. Um, then... I wish I had have asked, this is not more of a uh, knowing how to, because I, I knew how to do a lot of intakes and outputs from med surge, but I should have asked right away, say, hey, uh, how do you guys do your intakes and outputs? Do you prefer to do them on the hour, every hour? And do you want me to chart from the previous hour or the upcoming hour? And how do you want me to chart the flushes? Because a lot of the time, people who are tube, they also have a, a, a gastric tube that goes in the mouth so they can go to the stomach so we can feed them um, uh, oral medications. And a lot, of them, a lot of them are also getting tube feedings as well, which is different apparently from um, TPN because, I, get, um, because I, I remember now TPN is only through a central line. Whereas tube feeding, we can do that through the uh, G-tube. Um, another thing is, uh, I'm also glad that I brought uh, Cliff Bar. <laughs> I think I peed only about uh, three or four times throughout the 12 hour shift. And I had one break before everything went south. And then once everything went south, I don't think I sat down from 6.30 a.m. to about 3 p.m. And, and even then, I was still keeping an eye on the monitors. So I'm glad I was able to bring a snack and some coffee uh, that I could just run into the break room, grab, take a bite up, put it back in the bag, and run back out. So yeah, that was my first day at the ICU. I hope that helps you. And if you have any questions, please feel free to comment down below. And I hope you follow me. Sorry about my last video. I got a little emotional. And um, I'm going to try to be a little bit more professional. But yeah, nurses are human, we make mistakes, and sometimes we get a little bit emotional. So I hope to keep more track of that, and I hope to learn more. And if I learn more, I'll make sure to pass it on to you. So just talk to me, put down a comment, and um, subscribe, like the video, 
and I'll see you soon. Bye.